Welcome to Context TV. Our guest today here at the Institute of Latin American Studies at the Free University of Berlin is Emmanuel Wallerstein. He is professor for sociology at Yale University in the US. He is best known as founder of the so-called World System Analysis. Welcome to Context TV, Thank Emmanuel you. Wallerstein. Professor Wallerstein, we met four years ago in Dakar, Senegal, and talked about the growing instability of the capitalist world system. Since then, a lot has happened. The rise and fall of the Arab Spring, the, acceler the accelerating crisis uh, in southern Europe and in the Eurozone, uh, the Ukraine crisis, and also uh, the rise of the uh, Islamic State in Iraq, Libya, and elsewhere. Are we on a path into more and more global instability and if so why well yes absolutely we're on a path to more and more global instability and why why we're in we're in a, a systemic transition uh, with the uh, uh, we're in a systemic crisis of the capitalist world system such that it's uh, falling apart uh, and and will in fact go out of existence we're in a transitional phase that's a long transitional phase, 60, 80 years, and we're in the middle of that, uh, and that is characterized by this chaotic uh, fluctuations that are enormous in the economy, in, in the geopolitics, in, in everyday life, in everything, and all of the things that you have mentioned are simply part of that chaotic uh, uh, disturbances that are uncontrollable, very f frightening to people, as well they should be because it's a it's a, a very risky situation at an individual level uh, as well as at a systemic level so yes we're, we're in a crisis it's getting worse it's not getting better it's not going to get better than until it is resolved in one way or the other by tilting in one direction or the other of the bifurcation uh, in which we find ourselves you say that in your analysis it's a 500 years system which comes to an end. That's right. Um, what is coming exactly to an end and what are the p perspectives? Well, it's a system built on the ceaseless accumulation of capital. And to accumulate capital, uh, you have to uh, make what is called profit out of productive enterprises. Uh, and the fact is that the costs of, of, of the production are going up, have gone up so high, and the possibilities of uh, uh, effective demand for that production have gone down so low uh, that you can't really make profit. You can't accumulate capital. So uh, lots of people have always been unhappy with the capitalist system, but this, in addition to that unhappiness coming from the base, there's now the realization by capitalists that it isn't working in their favor, that they can't accumulate the capital. So the, the question is finding some alternative mechanism of maintaining their wealth, their power, uh, their privilege, etc. cetera. Uh, so, we have a situation in which no one wants the continuation of the system uh, for, for different kinds of reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, where the, pro the, the question before us is not, do we like this system or do we not like this system, but what system should replace this system? And there are two basic alternatives, one better, one worse, in my view. But that's my appreciation of the situation. Um, it sounds a little unfamiliar when we, uh, that the accumulation of capital is no longer possible when we look at companies like Apple or ExxonMobil who make, yeah. which make huge profits. So w what is your view on that? Yes, but you, they make huge profits, but the, the, uh, the, the, key, the key thing to look at is, is not so-called growth, which Apple is a good example of. Uh, growth, after all, can be cancerous. Uh, growths are not necessarily good things. The key thing to look at is, is employment, and to look at employment levels at world level, at world figures, and not, not national figures, which are irrelevant. Basically, if it goes up or down in one nation, it's quite irrelevant. And if you look at those figures, employment 
unemployment figures have been going up and up and up. And the fact is that the new kinds of industries that get uh, founded these days and out of which you can make some money don't employ many people. Uh, th that's the real problem uh, today. It's not only that the, uh, uh, how shall I say, the, the, the unskilled workers are no longer needed, been replaced by machinery, but the skilled workers are no longer needed. In fact, uh, the, the, uh, what we call middle class white collar workers are no longer needed and, uh, uh, and basically being replaced by all kinds of um, mechanisms that that's that's fine for an individual company, but what it means is there's nobody to buy the products, and that's the real problem. That no, there's nobody to buy the products. If there's nobody to buy the products, it doesn't make sense to invest money in trying to s create the products to be sold. And so we're in that kind of squeeze everywhere, uh, which doesn't get better; it gets worse and worse and worse. You've also written about speculation that when well, investment is no longer profitable. Yeah, well, but speculation doesn't doesn't create new capital. Speculation is just a mechanism of shifting the capital from the hands of A to the hands of B. That's fine for B and bad for A, but it does nothing for the system as a whole. That's the point. You have written extensively also about the decline of U.S. hegemony in the world. Um, however, the, the U.S. Is, has still, is still controlling the world seas. They have military bases all over the place. They have um, uh, uh, intelligence, which is pervasive. So why do you think that U.S. hegemony is on the decline? And what is coming after that? A truly multi multi-parallel world or... Chinese 21st century? The U.S. has by far and away the most impressive military structure in the world today. Nobody could declare war on the United States and have a, the vaguest hope that they could win. But that's irrelevant, you see, because we can't use, the United States can't use that military. That's what it has discovered in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, and, 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 and this is what is terrifying uh, Obama about getting tr so-called troops uh, on the ground. We can't use the forces and therefore people don't have to take account of it. That's it. It's, it's the strongest military in the world but it's an irrelevant factor in the, in the real world. Uh, all we can do is bomb, right? Okay, that, that, that's, that's pretty good, except that, that, that antagonizes people all over the place, uh, makes the situation even worse, and then you have to bomb some more, uh, and you have to get somebody else to send troops on the ground. Well, now other people are being asked, please send the troops on the ground that the U.S. can't send, and they say, why should we? Uh, we'll get the, into the same kind of trouble uh, that you're in. So... Uh, What can I say? Um, today, uh, the U.S. has a strong military, but it doesn't have a strong military. It doesn't have a strong military because back home, nobody wants to send troops on the ground. They, they, they don't want American troops on the ground, surely. That would, that would get any president in, in enormous trouble in the United States, which they, they, they know. Uh, and people want you to bomb for them, But then they want to complain about the fact that you've bombed for them uh, and be angry at you for that reason. It's a hopeless p situation for the United States. The United States has no real effective choices. It is, it is, it's powerful, but it's powerless at the same time. And, and it's, people don't want to see the powerlessness of the United States, which is increasing, not decreasing. Which role does trade play in that respect? Uh, there are a lot of new big trade deals on the way, uh, the TTIP between the European Union and uh, the United States, TPP between Pacific states. Is that an, an attempt to restore? Uh, well, it's an American attempt to, do, to, to, to get a, uh, a certain privileged position for, for U.S. enterprise, but these trade deals are not going to go through. Let me predict it now here. They're, they're all, they're, the U.S. would like to have those trade deals, and there are certain 
partners which are interested also in having it, but there, there's so much opposition to the trade deals that the trade deals are not going to go through, neither at the Pacific ones nor the Atlantic ones. Um, so the U.S. is trying, but it's not going to succeed. So you'll come back two or three or four years from now and we'll, we'll, we'll see that they've given up. Uh, after all, if you look at the uh, trade deal that they were trying to settle in 1996, international property at, uh, at Seattle, uh, where it was scuttled, ever since then, ever since then, they have been trying to revive that, and no revival has ever occurred or ever will occur, so that the World Trade Organization, for example, now is an absolutely irrelevant institution. It's there on paper, but it doesn't do anything. It can't do anything. Ukraine has become a hotspot of hegemonic fights between the US and Europe and Russia. What is that conflict about, in your view, in a geopolitical <coughs> perspective? What are the interests of the US, of Germany also, the EU and Russia on the other side? Well, first, if you start with Russia, I think Russia's interest, single primary interest, is not to have uh, 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 the Ukraine in, the, uh, in, in NATO or in the European Union. And if you gave Russia that, she would be happy, okay? Now, what is the United States' interest? The United States' interest uh, at, at, at this point is defined in terms of uh, a lot of domestic pressures to support the virtuous uh, Ukrainians. The Ukrainian government's interests, the, the one in Kyiv, Uh, is, 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 is to establish itself as a member of these European institutions and, and, and NATO. Germany's interest, France's interest, is not, is not to have the Ukraine in the European Union. Uh, uh, for, for very good reasons, because they don't want to cut their ties with, with Russia. So they make a pretense of supporting the U.S. position, but they drag their feet on everything that's essential about the attempt to pressure the uh, Russia and its position. So we, we've, we've, we've got a, a sort of stalemate there, uh, and it will continue to be a stalemate. Uh, furthermore, of course, aiding the Ukrainian government uh, economically is an extremely expensive proposition because they, they're in really bad shape economically uh, and nobody wants to pay that bill, not even the United States. So I, I don't see any, there's only one solution uh, and uh, no, no less than Henry Kissinger suggested a long time ago, which is the Finlandization of, of the Ukraine. That is, uh, let them have whatever they want in terms of their verbal uh, ideologies and so forth and so on. They can be as European as they want, but not in any European institution and not in any Soviet institution. So they're a kind of de facto neutral power. Uh, and uh, that is the solution. There are people in the United States who are trying to sabotage that solution. Uh, they could conceivably succeed. That's, that's not impossible, but it would be disastrous. Do you think the U.S. would go to war with Russia in an extreme case if you have a Republican You can't go government? to war with, this, with, with Russia. That, that, that's a nuclear... I mean, you know, we're, we're in the same situation in respect to war that we were in 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, neither side can afford a war because a war would be too destructive. Uh, it would be catastrophe. Uh, now, there are some people who would, would risk that, uh, but I don't think they're in control of the situation either in the United States or in Russia. So no war, absolutely. Uh, and that is, of course, a limit to the power of the United States. It can't go to war over this. Uh, you already mentioned the structure crisis of the world system. Uh, you also uh, are writing that a struggle about a possible successor system or successor systems is already going on. 
who is engaged in this struggle and what options are there? What are the possible outcomes of this struggle? I, the, what are the possible outcomes I can talk, talk about more easily than who is engaged in it? The possible, there are only really two theoretically possible outcomes. One is to create a new non-capitalist system with, which, however, shares the uh, worst features of capitalism, hierarchy, uh, mo uh, exploitation, and inequality, growing inequalities, okay? Now, uh, you can do that in many ways other than through a, mar um, a capitalist system, and people will try to invent these ways. That's one alternative. The other alternative is quite the opposite. It's to create, for the first time in history, a relatively egalitarian, relatively democratic system. Okay? So these are the two alternatives. And that's what we're fighting about, even if people don't realize that's what we're fighting about. Okay? So who is fighting? Well, most people aren't aware that they're in this kind of battle. Okay? So there are small groups on each side who are aware and are trying to mobilize people. Because basically, uh, in this kind of chaotic situation, we have a, a you, you, how shall I put it? The, the historical debate of Western philosophy has been between determinism and free will. And people took a position on which is the basic reality of the world. Is it a determinist world or is it a world of free will? And I say you have to historicize that. Uh, it's not one or the other. It's one or the other at different points in time. That when a system is in normal operation, it is a determinist system. The more you can try to change it in very fundamental ways and it gets pushed back to an equilibrium, maybe a a moving equilibrium, but to an equilibrium. When you're in the transition from one system to another, when you're in a structural crisis, then you're in a system of free will because every little motion on everybody's part shifts the system in significant ways, right? So uh, it, it's, the, it's the theory of the butterfly, right? The, uh, uh, it was discovered 40, 50, 60 years ago, right, that uh, if a butterfly flaps its wings over here, at the other end of the world, it changes the climate because it changes the initial conditions uh, uh, of, uh, of, of some process. Okay, so I always say at that point, we're all little butterflies, right? And every nano action in every nano way affects the outcome. But while we know that the outcome has to be one or the other of these two uh, wings, uh, two branches of the bifurcation, what we don't know is which branch will win. There's no way of predicting that. So we just have to struggle along and fight along and try to persuade more butterflies to, to do things on our side than on the other side. Yesterday you talked about the errors of the old left, what you call the two-step ideology, first see state power and then change the world. And you have said that, that this ideology has failed historically. Uh, so why has it failed and what are the alternatives? Uh, horizontal, decentralized struggle for change? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, has, it has failed because it succeeded. It succeeded um, basically in the period 1945 to 70 came to power all over the world, anti-systemic movements, and they didn't change the world. And they didn't change the world uh, uh, because, uh, how shall I say, they didn't want to change the world. Uh, or, or when they came to power, they wanted to uh, pursue their privileged positions, etc. Uh, what's the alternative? Is it horizontalism? Yes, I think it is. I think it is, but it, I have to persuade people. Uh, explain, explain what horizontalism well, means in opposition. Well, horizontalism means uh, that uh, it, you assemble a family of anti-systemic movements of all conceivable kinds, right? Uh, and you listen to each other, 
and you talk to each other and you try to learn from each other, but you don't create a single structure with a hierarchy within it, right? And, 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 and you support each other in thrusts. So five movements over here may get together to do X, and six movements over there may get together to do Y. And that's all good. That's all a plus, right? Without attempting to create a verticalist structure, which inevitably means we have to exclude movements that don't pursue the exact verticalist strategy, which is what the old left used to do and meant a continuous splits of the various movements, endless splits of the movements, endless angers, endless attempts to control the other, etc., which in the long run turned out to be self-defeating. You talk also about the spirit of Davos in opposition to the spirit of Porto Alegre. Explain what you mean. Well, I, I just use those as, uh, how shall I say, uh, language to summarize uh, the two alternatives in, in the bifurcation. The spirit of Porto Alegre is the spirit of moving towards a relatively democratic, relatively egalitarian world. And the spirit of Davos is the spirit of finding a new structure that will replicate the the advantages to the privileged minority of the old system, but based on some new kind of method of doing that. And uh, that could turn out to be far worse than the actual, than the, than the negative system we now have. But in any case, it won't be better. What about the splits with, within the spirit of divorces? Ah, well, yes. You see, within, 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 within each of these um, two spirits, there are two versions of what to do, so they're fighting with each other. The, the Davos uh, people are fighting between uh, using the technique of uh, forceful repressiveness versus the uh, technique of uh, seductive uh, pseudo-reforms, right? Uh, which could be attractive to people on, uh, on the other camp. And the spirit of Porto Alegre is, uh, uh, is uh, a split between uh, the horizontalists and a sort of revived version of verticalism. So we really have four points of view floating around. And that gets very complicated for people to understand and appreciate and analyze uh, and leads to still greater confusion. Um, but that's the reality. Uh, we're living in a very difficult uh, world in which it is difficult to discern what we ought to do, how we ought to do it, and all within the context of not knowing what the outcome will be. We, we cannot know intrinsically who will win. We can only hope and work to make our side win.